awakening of the eye of faith, which is the awakening of the contemplative process to a certain point, where you now begin to see the divine presence in everything. To see God present there is, is an enormous elevation of the capacity to see, because it's seeing not just through a microscope, but it's seeing the presence and source and the love and the person of the Trinitarian relationships that are uh, present in the smallest particle that we know of and beyond. He, he's always speaking to us, but not in our language, in his language, which is basically science, uh, silent, but it's, it's, it's intuitive, it's, uh, it's tele telepathic. Mm -hmm. So what I've noticed when I felt God is trying to tell me something is it, 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 the uh, phrase comes up on a screen, you might say. <laughs> Not a computer because I don't know how to use them. But inwardly, it's as if you have the whole sentence at once. You know, as in a computer, you don't wait for the words. Sometimes they're all there. So it's like that. You get a, a kind of nudge or a kind of hint or a kind of suggestion. And, and it's all there in a few words that are not spoken, mm. but that are, are perfectly clear, sometimes clearer than at other times. And, and that's because the divine presence is always within us. And, and, and this can be understood as the glorified Christ, or as the Holy Spirit, or as the Trinity, or as the higher consciousness, or as the one self, or as the higher self, I mean. So I think God has many ways of communicating, him, and, uh, and they're all valuable, they're infinitely valuable. But some will be more suitable for us at certain stages of our journey. But the practice of silence helps them all, because that gives God a greater freedom to act as our interior life becomes freer from our predispositions and predetermined mindsets. So, so the first thing then is God hides behind uh, and in uh, visual things in such a way that he's never absent. So the, so the person whose, whose interior eye, whose third eye of faith has opened, sees that, not as a particular object, but uh, as a presence in some way that is uh, intuitive rather than just sensible. Then uh, hearing things so, in such a way that that we're always listening, no matter what is being said, to this sound of sheer silence, which is God's presence passing by. So between the syllables, between the words, by just sitting still, uh, deep listening, this can be done in Lexio too, by going slowly and pausing when you feel drawn to silence. This is allowing silence to morph into presence. And presence is, is clearly God's presence. And when that presence is functioning, the other ways of getting there uh, become immediately obsolete, for the moment at least. And so then uh, the sense of attraction to silence, that's the sense of smell is an attraction to pleasant odors or move away from stinks. <laughs> but basically, it's an attraction to something delightful. So, so silence or solitude or prayer draws people inwardly, and that, that is how God is hiding behind some 
perfumes and I suppose incense and uh, fragrant candles and so on uh, have the same purpose. Then we have a touch, which is the sense of being kissed or embraced or held or cuddled or, or uh, embraced as, mm -hmm. which is when the presence actively does uh, steps out of the presence into some kind of activity that is applies that presence to our bodies and minds and spirit. And let's see. Then taste would be the arising uh, the within of the presence of God. And uh, so you will notice if you look at scripture from this perspective, it's often talking about the, the perfume of God, the taste of honey in the mouth, and, and of course in the Song of Songs, it's filled with all those mm -hmm. images. So, uh, but they're not the end of the journey. They're kind of a, a, a romantic aspect of it that is perhaps more important than people think. On the night of Christ's resurrection, when he visits the disciples upstairs in the room, he first says, peace be to you. And he shows them his wound. Then he said it again, peace be to you. Then peace is like a divine kiss. It establishes a certain disposition of, of, of uh, enjoyment or contentment or readiness for uh, the, the relationship, whatever it is. And then he breathed on them. This is very significant symbol because the breath is is is. Uh, uh, he clarifies it in case there's any doubt. Receive the Holy Spirit. So, so the the kiss has become even more passionate, you might say, in the spiritual sense, because it's and and the giving of the spirit is the interpenetration of spirits. So the oneness of, of the uh, continuing experience of loving with fidelity and trust and love begins to move into a unity consciousness in which the presence of God and us are not distinct anymore. And, and uh, this isn't usually a permanent state in this world because of the uh, other things you have to do to survive. But uh, this is, is uh, presupposes that after the transforming union, a new level of Christian life opens up that is meant to go further to a from a union, as wonderful as that is with the God, to a, a, a unity in which God takes over the faculties more and more, and as in Jesus manifests himself in everything we do by suggesting what the right response to every situation is uh, from the perspective of divine love. All self-interest is transformed into abandonment to the divine will and, and, the, and the openness to manifesting it. So, uh, so this is heaven on earth, that's for sure, but it's extremely down to earth and it doesn't need extraordinary consolations, or still less visions or things. It's just leading ordinary life from this extraordinary perspective of, of, of allowing God to manifest in us rather than ego or false self or anything else.